Today's video is proudly sponsored by Linode. Linode has been doing cloud computing since 2003, which is actually before Amazon Web Services was even a thing. On Linode's platform, you can get your server up and running in minutes. And they include all the popular distributions, such as Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and get this, even Arch Linux. And let's be honest, what could be better than a Linux-focused cloud server provider that lets you tell all of your friends, I run Arch? Linode has multiple server plans available to make any app scalable and flexible. You could use it to host a blog, a VPN server, a Minecraft server, and much more. In fact, Linode is the platform of choice to host the entire web presence of Learn Linux TV. In addition, Linode offers 24 by 7 365 support, regardless of plan size, so you can get help from a live person when you need it. New users can get started right now with $100 towards your new account, and I highly recommend you check them out because Linode is awesome. And now, let's get started with today's video. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, we're going to talk about storage, again. Because in a previous video, I gave you guys all the basic details of getting started with adding additional storage volumes to your Linux system, things like formatting a file system, mounting a volume, things like that. But what I didn't show you guys how to do yet was how to set it up such that your volumes will be automatically mounted when you start up your computer or your Linux server and that's going to be the subject of today's video. Now, before we get into the topic at hand, I just want to mention real quick that I love making content for you guys. It's incredibly fun. I love doing these videos. I have a blast. And I love Linux, so it all works out. But as much as I love this channel, it's a lot of hard work. So if you are able to become a patron and support this channel, I would really appreciate it. That's what Matthew Michael did. He became a sponsor and chose the tier that provides a shout out as one of the perks and I'm giving him that shout out right now. Hi, Matthew. And just like Matthew, you could become a patron and support the channel. I would really appreciate it. And among the other perks, you can get early access to select videos and also ad free versions of videos as well. And this video right here was both an ad free video and an early access video. So for patrons, they got two benefits from this video all in one. So go ahead and check out the Patreon page for Learn Linux TV. I would really appreciate that. Now let's go ahead and get into the topic at hand and find out how to automatically have our storage volumes mounted when we start our server. All right, so here I am on my Linux terminal and I'm ready to get started. Now, before we actually get started, there's a quick disclaimer that I need to give you guys. And I think this is an important disclaimer anytime we're actually working with storage be very careful when working with storage. If you enter any commands incorrectly, you could accidentally wipe the wrong device. Your system might not boot the next time. We need to be very careful. On my end, I'm not responsible for any data loss if you make a mistake or even if you do something wrong on purpose. Whatever the case is, just be careful, have good attention to detail, and you should be fine. Secondly, in order to follow along, if you are going to follow along, you could just watch, but if you're gonna follow along, Make sure you have an extra storage volume available and that you don't care about any of the data on that volume. It doesn't really matter what kind of storage you add. It could be a flash drive. If it's a virtual machine, you could add a new virtual disk. All that matters is that it's disposable, that it doesn't have any data on it that you wanna keep. You're free to remove everything on it and that's fine. On my end, I'm going to use a flash drive for the example in this video. Again, it doesn't matter. In fact, if I enter the lsblk command, you can see right here that we have disk sdb attached to the system. It's not mounted. If it was, I would have had a mount point right about here, but I don't. I went ahead and unmounted it before I hit the record button. I have one partition on that flash drive, sdb1, as you see here. And anytime you enter commands on your end, just make sure you are checking the device name. It'll most likely be different. If you target the wrong device, bad things will happen. But anyway, as you can see here, I have a 16 gig flash drive with one partition. 
and the partition itself is formatted with ext4. That's what I decided to go along with. So on your end, just make sure you have an ext4 file system ready to go. If you don't, make sure you watch my storage video, like I mentioned earlier. This video is actually going to piggyback off of that video. Normally, the videos in this series can be watched in any order, but this is just one of those exceptions where you really should watch that storage video first because the content that I'm about to go over piggybacks off of that video. So here we have SDB, and what I want to do is automatically mount this particular partition every time I start up the computer. Now what I'm going to do is enter the mount command, and as you'll remember from the previous video, the mount command will give you a listing of everything that's mounted, but there's quite a few things beyond storage, so it's going to be quite a bit of output, so I am going to grep for SDB. Again, you can use the lsblk command to find out what your device name actually is. I'm just grepping for that device name, and we can see that it's not mounted. That's important because we want to make sure that we mount the file system first, and that we're able to access it before we go ahead and automate the process of mounting that at boot time. But when it comes to storage, we can't actually use it until we mount it, and we can't even mount it until we have a designated place to mount it to. A directory is basically what we need to attach storage to, and that directory, it can be anywhere. Now as far as which directory in particular you should mount your storage volumes to, there's always a bit of debate when it comes to things in Linux, and that's no exception. There's two directories, like I've gone over in the previous video on storage. There's slash mnt, and then there's also the directory slash media. Generally speaking, slash media is for your temporary storage volumes. You know, things like flash drives that you might not always have attached. You basically want to plug in a flash drive, use it, and then remove it. But when it comes to our use case, we want to use the slash mnt or slash mount folder like you see here. That's going to be the target. So now we know where to mount it, but how do we actually set that up? There's a dedicated file for this purpose, and it's known as the fstab file. You might also hear it referred to as the fstab file. If I cat the contents of it, it's located at slash etsy slash fstab, like you see here. The content is wrapped because the font size is really large, so it's not going to make any sense at all right now, so I think it's better if I open it in an editor. I'm going to need to use sudo because, well, I need to have root privileges in order to edit that particular file. I'm going to use nano, and in case you're curious, vim is my preferred text editor, but nano is a bit easier to explain in videos, that's why I use that. And then the file that I want to edit is slash etsy slash fstab, like you see here. Now I'm going to drop the font size a bit here, and I don't want to make it too much smaller than that because it might be hard to see. But I think it's easier to understand this file if the lines are not wrapping, so we'll just work with this. So what is the fstab file anyway? If you're not already aware, the fstab file is responsible for automatically mounting storage volumes when you start your Linux computer or server. Each one of these lines is a different storage volume. You could actually mount disks here, network storage volumes, there's all kinds of things that you can mount with the fstab file. And you're going to have some things here automatically because, well, the root file system, as we see here, is part of this file. So if I was to comment out this bottom line right here where it mounts the root file system, my server or computer will not boot. It just won't. It won't be able to find the root file system. And that's an important takeaway here. If you make a mistake, your computer will not boot. So just be careful. You absolutely won't want to comment out this line. In fact, You'll probably not want to edit any of these lines here because we want to leave those lines alone. The only thing we want to do at this point is add a new line to this file. Now what I like to do on my end is add a line break in between the content that's already here and the content that I'm about to add. And there's actually two ways that we can automatically mount a file system. I'm going to show you the easiest way or simplest way and then I'll show you a different method utilizing a UUID that's a little bit more involved, it's not too bad, it is the preferred way, so just bear with me. And I mentioned UUIDs, we can see a few of them here, but we'll get to that. We're not really worried about what those mean just yet. 
Now, what you wanna do is add the storage volume to a new line in this file to have it automatically be mounted. And the first thing you're going to do is type the device name and its location. So in my case, it was slash dev slash sdb1. And the next thing you do is you type a location where you want it to be mounted to. So in my case, I'm going to type slash mnt, and then I'm going to name it my disk. Now, I didn't create this directory yet, so we don't want to actually have this mount anything just yet, at least until I create this directory, but that's where I want to mount this particular volume to, and we'll create this directory shortly. And even though we're not going to change the lines up here, you can kind of follow along with those lines to understand what I'm about to do. So I mentioned that this is the root file system. So this field right here is going to be associated with the target directory, basically where you want to mount the storage volume to, and I'm following the same format down here. So then, if you look at this, that's a file system. We're clarifying that this particular disk is formatted with ext4. Now, we already know that slash dev slash sdb1 is formatted with ext4. We saw that in the output a while back. And I also mentioned earlier in the video that I went along with ext4 for that particular storage volume. So we know that we should type ext4 right here. If we type something incorrect, it's not going to mount it. Next, I'm going to add the options for this particular volume. Now, in my case, I'm just going to add defaults. Now, I'm not going to go over all the various options that you can have in this field. That would be a very long video. But defaults gives you, well, the defaults. But what does it mean exactly when I include defaults right here? Well, actually, defaults is inclusive of multiple other options. I'm just going to paste them right here. You don't have to type these in on your end, I'm just giving you an example. According to Debian's documentation, defaults refer to all of these options. You can see that each option is separated by a comma. Now a few of these we will be going over, some of them we won't. At this point, just understand that the options that you apply here control the type of access that you give. For example, RW is read-write, and I think you know exactly what that means. And then there's other options here. But it's much easier to just include defaults. And as you can see, I'm just following along. Here we have some additional options, but we're not going to go too far into detail on those. And then for swap, of course, we have defaults, which I actually mirrored right here. That's a good way to do it. If you don't have any specific preferences, then defaults is probably the best thing to add here. Next, what I'm going to do is add this field right here, and then also this one. But what I'm going to do instead is change that last character to a 1. But what exactly do those numbers mean in the first place? So this field right here refers to dump. And it's not something that we really use all that much anymore, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. I think you'll probably almost, if not always, see that set to 0. That just determines whether or not the entire file system needs to be dumped. But more specifically, what dump has to do with is backup. Again, we don't actually use that so much anymore, but that's what it's for. The last digit here refers to the order of file system integrity checking. Basically, when you have a problem or when FSCK, the file system checker, needs to run, it's going to basically run in a certain order. Zero means it's not going to run. It's just not really going to check it at all. And you might have seen this on other Linux distributions where... Sometimes if you start it up, it's doing a file system check, maybe a routine file system check, or if it lost power, it shut off abruptly, maybe it's going to be doing an integrity check on the next startup just to make sure everything is fine. But there's a certain order you want that to happen in, so the root file system should always be first. So technically, we could argue, and I'm not going to get into distribution choices here, that this last digit here on this line this one right here, I changed it to a 1. That means it's going to be the very first thing that's checked if there's a problem. That makes sense. It's the root file system. It's the most important file system. It should be the one that's checked first if anything has to be checked. So here, I probably shouldn't set this to 1. This isn't the root file system. I could set it to 2 instead, as I'm doing right here. I'll leave that up to you, but what I'm going to do is just revert everything to 0. You can always run a file system check manually if you want to run one. And now, at this point, we've gone over every field in the fstab file. 
Now I'm going to save this file. In the case of Nano, bringing up the save dialog was Control O, and now to exit is Control X. We definitely don't want to reboot at this point because, well, I didn't create that directory yet. That's not good. We definitely want to make sure that we create that. So what I'm going to do is run sudo mkdir slash mnt slash mydisk. That's the name of the directory I decided to go along with. That's what's in the fstab file. Now without this directory existing, then fstab would not be able to find it and that would be a problem. So I'm going to press enter and make sure that that directory exists. Back in the fstab file, again, we have the directory right here that needs to exist. And we are mounting slash dev slash sdb1. So let's go ahead and have some fun. So what I'm going to do right now is mount my flash drive. And the way I'm going to do it is type sudo and then mount slash mnt slash my disk. And I'm going to press enter. And it worked. But how did it work? I didn't even tell it what I wanted to mount. Specifically, what I want to do is mount slash dev slash sdb1, but I didn't type that. I just typed sudo mount and then the target directory. Now the reason why that works is because we have identified a match of that directory to slash dev slash sdb1 in the fstab file. And to make the output simple, I'm going to grep for my disk. And here we have that new line that we added to the fstab file. Now, when I typed sudo mount slash mnt slash my disk, this directory, the target directory that I clarified here in the command, was found in the fstab file. So the system knows that this directory is associated with this particular device right here. So that's allowed me to simplify the mount command quite a bit. That's pretty cool. So now what I'm going to do is unmount that. And I'm going to show you how to test the fstab file because we definitely want to make sure that the fstab file has no errors. That's really important. The command that I'm about to give you will not detect all errors that you might have. So don't run the following command and assume that everything is okay if you see no errors. It's just one more check. You definitely want to make sure you are visually checking the file as well. But what I'm going to do is run sudo mount dash a. I'm going to mount everything that is in that fstab file that's not already mounted. Now we can go ahead and ignore this duplication right here. This is a desktop Linux distribution, so I think it's a little bit confused as far as what I'm doing here because it tried to automatically mount it and I manually mounted it as you see here. But either way, when we ran this command right here, we didn't see any errors. That's a good sign. That doesn't mean we don't have any mistakes at all. It just means that mistakes in the fstab file are a lot less likely. Now when I ran it, it noticed that this device right here was not mounted and went ahead and mounted it. If this directory didn't exist, it wouldn't have been able to do that. That's one issue that it might be able to find. Again, just double check it. But so far, everything looks good. But unfortunately, we do have a real problem here that we haven't fixed. Now I know that the font size here is quite large, but I want to make sure that you guys are able to see this. I talked about the UUIDs before. We see one right here, for example. But right there, I'm actually calling out the system path for that device which is technically valid. It did work. I was able to mount it. So it looks like everything is okay. But the problem is SDB1, as you see here, that is not static. If I restart this computer and that device gets a different device name, then this entire line is going to be invalid. And you might actually get an emergency console when you try to boot your server if it's trying to boot a device that it's not finding. So if this flash drive, for example, was given the name SDC as the device name, so the partition in that case would be SDC1, then it's not going to find SDB1. That's especially true when you are inserting and removing flash drives because those device names can be utilized quite quickly. So what do you do instead? Well, that's where the universally unique identifier comes into play, which is what UUID stands for. 
So here for the root file system, and again, we know it's the root file system. We have a single forward slash right here. It's actually looking for a UUID, and I'm not even going to try to say all of this in the video, but this identifier, this name right here, is what it's looking for. It's not looking for slash dev slash SDA1 or whatever it might be. It's looking for this. So if I was to exit out of this file, and for simpler output, I'm just going to use the df command here, which is another way to see what's mounted. Technically, df is disk free. It tells you how much space is available on each of your file systems, but it also lists all the file systems that are mounted as well. And right here, we have a single forward slash, and this is the device name right here that it's trying to mount. Now, it's beyond the scope to explain why this is so different than sdb1. On your end, it might not be different. There's other ways that you can manage disks that I'm not going to get into just yet. But if this was to change, well, that's not good because if it's not able to find it when it goes to boot it, then that's a problem. But in the FS tab file, it's not even mentioning slash dev slash mapper slash data root. It's referencing the UUID instead. And the reason for that is because the UUID will never change, no matter what. So let's go ahead and see that. So I'm going to run the BLK ID or block ID command. I want to know what the UUID is of the storage volumes on my system. And I'm using sudo because I want to see everything. I don't want anything to be hidden from me. I want to see all the information. So there's quite a bit of output here, but the block ID command, BLK ID, what that does is it gives you the UUIDs for all of the storage volumes on your machine. So now you can actually see what the UUID is, and that tells you what you need to reference if you want to use that instead of the device name, and you definitely should use the UUID instead of the device name. Now if I scroll up a bit here, we can see that we have dev mapper data root right here at the top, and then it gives us the UUID. So what we're going to do right now is compare this to what's in the FS tab file. So go ahead and memorize every single character, Okay, I was kidding. No way. Do not do not even try to memorize a UUID. It's just not even humanly possible. Well, it is humanly possible, but we have better things to do. Anyway, it starts with A4, ends with E. I think that's good enough. And right here, we have a UUID that starts with A4, ends in E. So it matches. And that's how we know what a UUID is for a volume. We simply run the sudo blkid command and that gives us that information. Now, in our case, we were in the process of setting up this volume right here, SDB1. So now we know what the UUID actually is for that particular device. So I'm going to copy that. Now what I'm going to do is run sudo umount. I want to unmount that. And we can see that it's not mounted. So next, I'll edit the FS tab file. I'm going to go all the way down here to the bottom. And instead of slash dev slash sdb1, I'm going to remove all of that. I'll type uuid equal sign. I don't want double quotes or anything crazy like that here. Just the uuid. I'll paste it in. And there it is. That makes it quite a bit longer. But you know what? I like this better. Let's go ahead and save it. Next it out. I'll run sudo mount a again. And we can see here at the very bottom, slash dev slash sdb1 is mounted to slash mnt slash my disk. Even though I referred to it under its UUID, it was still able to mount that. And again, the reason why we like UUIDs is because we really don't know if this particular device name is always going to be attached to this particular device, it probably won't be. So we really don't want to rely on that. Instead, we should actually use the UUID, which is what we placed in the FS tab file. And that's what I recommend you place in your FS tab file for your volume. Again, you just run the blkid command, preferably with sudo, grab the UUID, copy it, paste it in the FS tab file, and just make sure that you test it, because if you don't test it, you're not really sure it's working, and then you reboot your server, your server will not appreciate having an error in the FS tab file, which will cause problems up to and including a failure to boot. So take your time.
Now, before I close out this video, there's another option with the FSTab file that I want to make sure you guys are aware of. So what I'm going to do is unmount that particular disk one more time. And let's open up the FSTab file yet again in Nano. And what we're going to do is go all the way down here and then all the way to the end where it shows defaults as the option. I'm going to add a comma and then no auto. Now earlier when I showed you all of the options that are included in defaults, auto was one of them. Auto is just one of the defaults when you use defaults. What auto means is that the file system is going to be automatically mounted. No auto is the reverse. It means that when the system starts, it will not be automatically mounted. So then you might be wondering, why would I want to add something to the FSTab file only to not have it automatically be mounted? We'll get to that. For now, just understand that no auto is the opposite of auto. So what I'm going to do is save the file and close out again. That particular device is not mounted. And it's still not mounted. Even though I ran sudo mount a, as you see here, which is supposed to mount everything that it finds in the FSTab file, it didn't actually mount the disk that we added to the FSTab file. It omitted that. And that makes sense. Again, at the end, we added no auto. So now going back to the question of what's the point of adding no auto to make it not automatically mount, yet still include it in the FSTab file, what's the gain? And the thing is, automatically mounting file systems is not the only benefit of the FSTab file. Yes, it's a main benefit, and probably the number one reason why it even comes up in a Google search to begin with, but it's not the only use case. I could run sudo mount slash mnt slash my disk. I didn't even have to give it the UUID or the device name. And it worked. And as you can see, it's mounted. So already we could see the benefit. So even though I chose to add the no auto option here, it was still worthwhile to add this particular storage volume to the Etsy FS tab file, because now I'm able to simplify the mount command I don't have to type the device name, I only need to refer to the target directory, and it'll be mounted. So you could add no auto here if for some reason you don't want this particular file system to be automatically mounted. Perhaps this is a backup drive that you are going to be attaching to your server regularly. It's not going to be attached all the time, but regularly. This will help you ensure that that particular device will always be mounted to the same place when you call the command, which makes scripting easier, it makes the command line easier. It's just a good idea. And if nothing else, another administrator can look at the FSTab file and they would immediately know the typical devices that you mount on a regular basis by simply looking at this one file. Another thing that we can glean from this is that even though default includes the option auto, you've essentially overridden that by including no auto. And another option inside the defaults is RW. So for example, RW, read and write. You can override that as well by changing that to RO for read only. And that's not a bad idea. The last thing that I'll mention in this video is that I highly recommend that you default everything to read only unless you have a very specific reason to allow write access to that particular volume. If you have a company share that has some very important things in there, you really shouldn't give everyone and everything read and write access to that only the people and the servers that need to be able to write to it. And the value there is that people can't delete everything on a storage volume, and I have seen this happen, someone coming in and accidentally deleting everything in the volume. They can't do that if they don't even have access to write or change the contents of that volume anyway. So read-only is a better default than what's currently in defaults, which is read-write. Again, if you have no specific need to make changes to the content, then read-only is definitely better. So there you go. Now you know how to automatically mount file systems and storage volumes when your Linux server starts up. That's awesome. And you also know how to not automatically mount things but still benefit from the convenience of the FSTab file. In addition, 
This was your introduction to the FSTAB file, so if you weren't already familiar with that file, now you are. So let me know what your thoughts are. I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Let me know in the comments down below, and I'll see you again very soon. Thanks for watching.